Welcome back. About 20 years ago, I started playing U.S. Chess Federation rated games. And I found, in searching for my name and my opponent's name for a recent game, I found a tournament report authored by Vince Hart in the Illinois Chess Bulletin about an event that happened in the Elmhurst Chess Club, some Game 5 tournament, some pretty low-stakes thing. And I found uh, around that time I was like rated 1500 or something and managed to win the Class C prize drawing against a master. And, you know, I was, this is just me playing my first sets of tournaments around that year, not really understanding the whole picture of uh, that drawing a master, especially in Blitz, is an extraordinary achievement that these days I would be elated to uh, observe, but um, yeah, those days I was just glad to have played against some friends or some, uh, I don't know, a lot of uh, folks that were able to play again in future tournaments. And uh, thereafter, yeah, uh, just took a greater and greater interest in playing, as I noticed I had some proclivity to be okay at the game. Um, so that doesn't really have anything to do with the recent game played here, other than having discovered both my name and my opponent's name were both in that document, although they're not a master that I drew or anything. They had a great performance at the Il the Chicago Open that year, um, whereas I had a great performance at my first, uh, one of my first tournaments I played at Elmhurst. But here we are 20 years later, uh, here I am playing a game under the Chicago Industrial Chess League, where this organization uh, originally had been a group of businesses, each of which had a chess club, and later expanded to include uh, chess clubs that were unaffiliated with any particular business. And so the league grew and grew and became quite... Uh, an exciting thing, and I believe now they have four divisions. Uh, they have for about at least a decade had four divisions in the Chicagoland area, and so each uh, business or each separate unaffiliated club has their own team, and the teams can go travel to each other's team sites, play some games throughout a season throughout the year, and then at the end of the year, um, some number of teams play in a championship for that they've qualified by playing uh, throughout the season. And so this commences our 2022 season. Uh, round one, I'm playing board three against expert Thomas Murphy, who once had a 2,150 USCF rating, which is about as close as you can get to being a chess master without actually getting the title. Yeah, he's claiming these days to be slightly rusty, but we'll see from the game that this was quite the battle. Um, keep in mind, we're all a bit rusty. None of us have had that much of an opportunity to play tournaments these days. And you've seen that I've been up to a lot of Shogi lately. I found Shogi fascinating, but my chess club said, Hey, Dan, wouldn't you like to play in this season? I'm like, sure, let's do it. I didn't realize... Um, one of these fun aspects of these matches is you get to be paired against whatever players the visiting team uh, plays. Um, I guess in this match, technically our opponents were the home team, but you get a list of like, here's the players who are in each club who have played in team games before, here's who's registered to play on the team, and you can guess from that who may or may not play in any given event. Um, I didn't realize I was going to be playing Tom Murphy. Maybe I should have known. But uh, anyway, here we are. I play d4. And I don't claim that opening study is my strength. Not at all. So uh, I'm trying to play some sort of calm position try to get something that doesn't have buckets of fireworks all over the board. 
even we know even though if you've seen my games in the past you know i have this tendency to try to make positions as complicated as possible uh that wasn't really my objective from the opening this game uh i think there are many things i can criticize about playing the cattle in here first of all i don't know the cattle in per se I am aware that if I hang the C pawn, I play bishop g2 and knight e5. So if I play this sort of thing, if my opponent takes my pawn, that there should be some compensation here for the pawn. I'm that much I'm aware of. But move orders, I've just found immensely challenging to deal with. One thing I did not want to see in this case um, was pawn b6. Uh, the Queen's Indian defense. This tends to be very sharp and annoying to deal with. It's... It, you can deal with it, but uh, it's not the world's easiest cup of tea. I'm just trying against an expert to get a playable position where I don't hang something in the first 10 moves. Um, so... Yeah, this here was... This is played in our uh, year-long season, so think of it as a tournament that has about eight or nine rounds that are spread out throughout the course of the year. This was not a USCF rated event, but this was a rated or a Chicago Industrial Chess League rating system rated event. I've been in touch with the URS folks to try to get our games rated by them. I haven't heard back yet. We'll see if I hear anything. But right now, yeah, it's just CICL runs its own rating system until we have something more authoritative but not quite as laborious as the uh, USCF to do. While many of players are USCF members, we just getting our games rated by USCF isn't an objective and would require everybody, every team to have TDs. and It's not something we're looking at it this time but yeah having some way to get the games rated we're just doing our own rating system it's pretty cool um part of the purpose of the rating system is to ensure that the matches are balanced and that clubs like my downers grove chess club are not unfairly advantaged over uh businesses so while i've been rambling here knight bd7 I was surprised to see, I was thinking they might castle instead of playing this. Playing this seems to me like they want to attack on the king's side immediately. Whereas if they had played just castling, and if I castle, this seems a lot calmer. I'm still out of my element here. But um, thankfully we more or less transpose. One independent possibility here, however, is that if I castle here, they could take this pawn. And I was not prepared for this. I did not know this line. I still don't know this line. Maybe this is playable. Maybe this is bunk. I don't know. It's hard to know, isn't it? If you study a lot, you'll know, like, clearly... Um, this has just gone, I don't know, out of book very quickly. Um, although we did try to stay in the Catalan lines. Bishop g2, again, trying to stay in the line. Knight bd7 really surprised me. Which This seems very aggressive. Simultaneously threatening, I think, knight f8 as well as c5. Um, as well as just pawn takes pawn. So... Yeah, this, if I castle, they just take the pawn. I don't even need to indicate this is a variation. This is just a threat here. So I've played this move in a tournament game against a class A player, somebody rated like 1900. I played this along with E3, I think about five years ago in a local tournament. We quickly thereafter agreed to a draw as neither of us could get any initiative. And as best as I could tell from this game, b3 also loses a tempo in this case. So my lack of knowledge has lost me a move. 
and so I am struggling to hold on to equality at this point at move 7. Yeah. B3 seems playable, but it also seems like it's confusing. And my playing style generally tries to be get playable yet confusing positions with an emphasis on the confusing and not so much on the playable aspect of it. So yeah, here they play pawn b6. I, oh goodness, I have time indicators on my score sheet from where I spent a lot of time thinking. Uh, so there were 90 minutes per player here. And previous to this move, I had 84 minutes. After I took this pawn, I had 71 minutes. So I spent 13 minutes thinking about all these variations that could happen here. So candidate moves to consider would be uh, bishop a3, bishop g5, bishop f4, rook e1, knight c3, queen c2, queen d3, e3, a4. Um, looked at a lot of things here uh, because my lack of knowledge means I have much to figure out, right? If I had known what was going on, then that would save me all the effort of having to... Oh yeah, I'm sorry, knight e5 also. So these are the candidate moves I spent 13 minutes looking at. We're playing at 90 minutes per player, plus 5 second delay. So um, let me attempt to show us in some sort of reasonable order what my thoughts were. Because this is sort of a hot mess. Um, I guess from most favorable to least... Oh, no, let's have some kind of ordering here. So, knight c3. Uh, this runs into, I think, three different, maybe four different objections. One simply is bishop b7, where seemingly I cannot find any way to assert an advantage of any kind here. Uh, for example, if I take this pawn, knight takes, and suddenly, like, yes, I have this d-pawn, and it's a beautiful d-pawn. Yes, I have some minor space advantage because my d-pawn uh, claims some space, but there's, like, nothing I can do here to continue any sort of an attack. They are going to start exchanging pieces, and the more pieces get exchanged the fewer winning chances I have in a position where already it's looking quite bleak. So that's one point, is that if I play knight c3, bishop b7, there's nothing I can do here. Um, but, no, I'm sorry, that's in the c takes d5 line. I did also later consider e4 here. Just really trying to spice it up, noting that if this were played, then I could play something like this. And this here might be playable. However, the problem isn't d takes e4, it's knight takes e4. And then if I try to repeat the same set of tactics, then they have f5. So in this case, like, Okay, yes, I weaken their pawn structure. Even though I like messy positions, this is not the sort of messy position that I would like to play. This looks like I am losing. Um, so I just did not... There are some positions even I won't play. And this, I guess, falls in that category. Even though maybe in a blitz game, maybe I'd do it. But all my pieces are on bad squares and have no hope of connecting with each other. I have a space deficit and my king side is weak. So that might not be the best way to go. Uh, pawn a4. Oh, that's funny. It just dismissed all my arrows. That's fine. There were too many arrows anyway. Uh, pawn a4. Pawn a5 doesn't really do anything. If anything, I've just made my b3 pawn weaker. So a5, if nothing else, 
is already quite convincing, but they probably have even better ways to refute this. So that's... We don't need to delve too far into this. There's no... This pawn push to a5 does not help me any more than pawn a4, but I do create a weakness on b3, and there is no way to remedy that. Further, if ever I end up taking on d5, then this weakness becomes even weaker. So this just surrenders any hope of initiative ever, while also threatening to exchange off things on the queen side, and you know, this just was not what we wanted. Uh, bishop a3 seemed a little bit interesting, uh, but I think this is the main problem, is that my knight is off sides. And already, like, with moves like bishop b7, um, my opponent's assumed the initiative, and my knight just remains off sides like this. I don't need this highlighted twice, but yeah, there's... It just takes too much time to get my knight back into the game. Unless the opponent's accommodating and takes on c4 and lets my knight back in. This um, was actually quite straightforward. I did spend some time looking at c5 as well, but, you know, this seemed like a wasted move. Even though this, in theory, this could lead to a position something like this. But even this is terrible for me. This is not the sort of position you want, because your opponent controls all the spaces, right? And this space domination is useful for the opponent because we have all the minor pieces. Had all the minor pieces been exchanged, arguably these hanging pawns could be a weakness rather than a strength, but here they're actually a strength because all the minor pieces are still on the board, and that means I'm going to have a lot of troubles here um, trying to like organize my pieces with a space deficit. But as if that weren't bad enough, yeah, just the main line where my knight ends up on the rim is pretty terrible. So that does also give rise to the idea of, well, what if we bring the knight out? You know, the knight hypothetically could be useful if we play it to b5. That's really a huge stretch to try to reach that conclusion. Further, um, like, uh, I'm trying to imagine some line where the knight ends up on b5 hitting the pawn and the bishop goes to f4. But uh, this is, like, held down guarding the knight, and there's just not a way to get an initiative here. So we considered that. Maybe there's more to it, but I didn't see anything more. Uh, bishop b2 just throws away a move. Like, unless I can get this pawn moving, which really isn't something I get to choose. Uh, unless this gets moving, there's no reason to block the bishop here. So, this, while maybe, it's really not a candidate. It's kind of an anti-candidate. Um, so, also, I took a look at bishop g5. However, I didn't see anything clear here either. Bishop b7 seems quite reasonable. h6 seems reasonable. Possibly? No, taking the pawn looks crazy. It's still crazy. Uh, so yeah, either one of these seems more than adequate. I probably would play bishop b7 in their boots here, but... Uh, we considered that. There's bishop f4. So this has the idea of knight c3, knight b5, again trying to attack the c7 pawn. Um, problem is, that's a bit one-dimensional here. There's the saying knights before bishops, and there's a reason. So this defends the c-pawn, which they can move to either c6 or c5 at their description. And I'm targeting a pawn. Like, this is not a constructive use of my time. Um, meanwhile, also, I don't know, hypothetically, something like this could happen. They just drop the knight back on f8. They have all the time in the world to prepare whatever pawn break they want to prepare. There's nothing for me to attack over here. And the bishop... Even worse, like, if I try to cement the bishop in place, um, it becomes a target, too. So, 
while maybe playable in Blitz circumstances, this just, it's the London. It's a worse form of the London. Unfortunately, it doesn't lead anywhere. Um, so, considered these possibilities, Knight E5 looked somewhat interesting. Uh, why did I dismiss this? I think, again, it was Bishop B7. And there's just no motivation for either of us to exchange pieces here. Um, so, yeah, there are shots if they don't play the right move, but they're going to play the right move. This is an expert we're talking about. Yeah, maybe Knight C3 makes some threats. Uh, it doesn't seem like much, and it seems pretty easily dealt with. Um, so... Yeah, I, I'm not in control of this position. It would be nice to control this position, command it, but I I don't think I have control over it. Maybe I'm completely wrong in my assessment of this. Maybe there's a lot going on that I'm just not aware of here. Um, but Knight C3, while it looks beautiful, I don't see it providing any sort of advantage. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what the opponent would play here, but I don't have a next move. I have three pieces attacking d5, but they have three defending it already. Um, maybe rook e8 might be a next move here, threatening knight f8, and just asserting like, the safest position ever. Um, and unfortunately, in this line, pawn e5 is even worse than pawn e5 in the other lines. Um, there's just no way to assert, like, let's say I play this, right? Um, then what do I do? How do I proceed here? I don't see it. Um, there's just, it's not clear what I'm doing. I need to have some clarity in my intentions, and I just don't. So knight e5, while it looks aggressive, just doesn't do anything, because they can defend the one threat, and then I don't have another threat. Um, did I show e4 here already? No. For a brief while, I considered e4 on account of pawn takes uh, being a blunder. Um, but they don't have to do pawn takes, they can do knight takes. And while this could lead to some kind of fun position, um, I'm not sure that this is a reasonable way to go. So this is just a straight-up gambit that doesn't seem to lead anywhere. It does prevent their bishop from going to this long diagonal and checkmating me on the long diagonal. So that's kind of nice. But otherwise, yeah, I don't know. Uh, side note, was this here? Or, no, I think it was in the game. I considered b4 as well, which seems to have some point. Um, the one idea is bishop takes c5, attempting to snare the bishop. Um, why did I reject this? I think my main concern was actually they just ignore it, and I've not done anything to help my position significantly. Maybe there's some more point to this. Um, there might be something to look at. I don't know. This is actually kind of murky. I don't know. Um... But if bishop takes b4... Oh, wait. No, if I play c4... Yeah, I don't think they're going to play... Hmm. What's the problem of d takes e4? Oh, in the e4 line here. Okay, so yeah, if they take d takes e4, this might not even have any problem, to be honest. So while normally being able to regain... Oh, I can't even regain the pawn, can I? Not even with something like this. Um, I don't know. 
I guess I could get the pawn back, but I think any chance I have of gaining an initiative has gone here uh, because of knight takes c5. So this, I just don't see a way to get an initiative here. Yeah, I can regain the pawn, but I don't think I get an initiative out of this. So my problem is just that I'm wanting more than the position has to offer here. Um, not at all content with this. But no, this might be playable. It's just I don't like it. I think that's the problem. It's me. I am the problem. No, but um, let's see. But no, you're asking... I guess I think this is even better for black than this other line. Although I think this is still problematic for me. Um, but this looks just straight up worse for me, where I'm down upon and with the worst position. Um, so maybe this is easier to survive though, because at least I have something to aim at, the C pawn. I don't know. Um, but I think none of this quite works out. If so, yeah, if this is one I should promote this up one level. So they're not gonna take MB4 on account of C5 unless there's some trick going on in this position here. And there might be, but I don't think so. But yeah, if I play B4, they can just defend this pawn. Alternatively, they could take on C4. Uh, let's see, how does this go? Can they take on c4? So this was the shot I was trying to set up. Um, yeah, I guess taking on c4 might not be so bright. So that means bishop b7 to defend against the diagonal opening is appropriate. And the problem I have here is that I don't seem to have anything better than pushing c5. And c5 is just such a lemon. Uh, it doesn't do anything. It weakens my pawn structure. And whichever way I choose to take back here, it's... If I take back with the center pawn, yeah, I keep my pawns together but I lose control of the center. If I take back with the B pawn, these pawns all collapse here. This is a gambit, or at least a temporary gambit, um, but this might not even be necessary. Like, there might be other ways to break this down, but this seems more than adequate. Um, so... Hmm. Hmm. If I'm trying to gain a tempo, I want to do that by hitting the knight and it not being able to go back. So after this move, maybe I have e6. So this might prevent e5 from immediately being available on account of crazy nonsense. Um... Maybe yeah, there's some tactical shots somewhere here to justify it. It doesn't seem likely, though, because they have a lot of pieces defending their king, and none of my pieces are active. So it seems hard to... Well, there's a shot. Speaking of shots... um, Didn't see this during the game. Not sure how I missed it. Uh, But no. So that's a shot, therefore pawn e5 might not be playable just yet. Um, so maybe rather than pawn e5... I mean, during the game it occurred to me they don't even have to push that immediately. I mean, this position looks quite desperate. It seemed... Well, I could stop pawn e5. I could. Um, this actually looks reasonable. 
Wait, if this looks reasonable, then maybe Pawn takes Pawn is unreasonable. There's got to be some point at which this breaks down. Did I just chicken out of an interesting gambit during the game? Did I chicken out? And is this interesting? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hang on. So, yeah, this D takes is a shot. It's not appropriate. This bishop b7 um, also looks reasonable, but doesn't seem like the best move. I think they just take this pawn. And if I attempt to instare the bishop, it still has the a5 square. So I'm just down a pawn. Um, yeah, maybe I have some attacking chances. Maybe it is interesting, but I didn't think so. Um, I wasn't content with this. Plus, um, what else might happen? Yeah, this just looks like a disaster. I know I want this to work, but I just can't see that working. So I think this becomes the refutation as opposed to the other lines we were looking at. Yeah. Yeah, c6 is a nice shot. That would have been a cool way for the game to continue. But anyway, so I spent 13 minutes looking at these and some other variations. Ultimately settled on pawn takes pawn. Didn't really want to do this move at all. Um, for two reasons. Well, no, I'm sorry, for one reason. And that reason was knight takes d5. And here... Um, it's not comfortable. Yes, I have a space advantage, but um, it's quite minuscule. And any attempt to expand the space advantage is going to be rebuffed. So this was my primary concern in this position. After looking at all those other variations, I had desperately been trying to avoid this position because, you know, not only do I, is my space advantage minuscule, but it seems they have like a really straightforward plan here. And there's really not a whole lot I can do. So this, yeah, I mean, it's a balanced position. I'm looking for chances. Yeah, I'm probably going to try something like e4 and knight c3 here. I'll just try to get some very quick attack in before my position's totally debunked. But I believe in my opponent's half of this position. So my queen ends up on the c file, as does their rook. And I just don't believe in this. This does not look playable from my side. They're threatening c5, so I think I'm forced to play this. And it's just, I don't think this works. Um, I can't find a way, even with this, even with threats on h7, like, even on an occasion where everything goes smoothly, um, I just can't amplify this attack. And meanwhile, they have complete control over the d5 square. And they have their rook aligned with my queen. And they have the knight on f8, so there is no checkmate. So, like, this is what I was trying to avoid. Um, this is... This, maybe there's something after knight takes... I mean, to me, this looks really straightforward. Maybe I'm missing the boat on this one. Maybe white has some brilliant stroke of... I don't know. I just don't believe it. Knight takes seems very strong, and I could not find a way to refute it. 
So that's why I spent 13 minutes earlier trying to avoid this. My opponent played pawn takes pawn. This blocks the long diagonal that is frequently used in the Queen's Indian defense. So all the most terrifying threats about bishop b7 and h6, g5, f5, all these nightmare situations are suddenly gone. All the pawn tension suddenly vanished. It's like completely new game at this point. I go first. I was quite happy to see this. So, yeah. Um, not sure what my opponent's perspective on this is. I apologize that I had forgotten to ask him after a game what that was about. Um, it was such an exciting game. So at this point, yeah, uh, this is not easy. So we're on move 12. After I've played my 12th move, I wrote down that I have 64 of my original 90 minutes. My opponent's clock still says 87 minutes or something quite similar. So, yeah, I'm not putting up any sort of a challenge to my opponent at this point. Um, I'm trying to keep my position flexible and trying to form some sort of attack that can land either on the queen side or on the king side. This sets up some vague sacrifice on h6 threat, which is instantly rebuffed. So, yeah. Bishop f8 has the one disadvantage that it prevents knight f8. Although that seems easily remediable by just playing g6, bishop g7, and then you can play knight f8 later. Um, yeah, so I keep trying to keep my position flexible, keep my options open. I keep looking at a4, and a4 doesn't ever seem to do anything, so... Uh, queen e7 does connect the rooks, and does so without having to move the knights or anything else here. So yeah, this does connect the rooks. Um, so I take the opportunity to play knight e5 here. Um, so yeah, at this point... Oh man, I have been looking at a lot of moves. Um, and... Uh, let's see. What was it that was so interesting here? So... Hmm. Yeah, another idea that crossed my mind was pawn e4. Um, which you would think sounds playable, right? Because I've got my rook on the same file as the opponent's queen. And maybe this is the best move. Could be. Somehow I talked myself out of it. Um, but maybe now as I'm looking at it again, maybe it's okay. Um, so during the game, my concern was f5. I didn't find an answer for this. And, like, you'd think f5 would be dangerous and you wouldn't want to do a move like that, but my pieces have retreated so far. So, um, I mean, alternatively, if I play, like, knight e5, um, I spent a little time looking at this, trying to make it work. Because it's nice that this pawn on e4 is hanging, but I think this runs into the same problem. And there's just... well, here I missed that. There might be some point to this. So maybe that has some point. Um, goodness. Maybe I'm forgetting something that I analyzed? Oh, right, so... During the game, I was looking both at that and at pawn takes. Um, with the idea of pawn takes, knight d2. And I can reclaim the pawn. Um, which, I mean, the idea of winning back my one pawn sounds kind of exciting, I guess. 
Um, but then I started looking at things like C5 and just, again, not seeing a way that I could get an initiative out of this. If knight b5 threatening knight c4, uh, knight c7, then this hits this while protecting that. I should do this with red arrows to say this is a black piece. But yeah, I saw stuff like this. I think this is what convinced me. Um, not this knight takes line, but uh, this other variation. This is what convinced me that I just don't really have any initiative here. Um, which is ironic, because, like, I missed this. Maybe there is something here, after all. Knight takes... Um... This gets messy. Knight takes... Knight d3. Um... My queen's hanging. Um, so that's one point, is that knight takes f4 looks threatening, but then there's also this. Um, but against that, I don't know. <laughs> this is going to be an exercise for the viewer. Sorry. Yeah, this, this is a bit over our heads, and I don't feel like throwing it into an engine. Because there's just so many fun things to look at. Um, but this is just one variation. Um, that's if they play c5. They don't have to play c5, right? So that's the best possible case, is if we go into this absolutely crazy line where everything's on fire and everything's hanging, and, you know, that's one possibility. Uh, another is something like queen b4. And just from a time management perspective alone, uh, I recognize that this... All of these things were more than I had time to consider properly. So I just played knight e5, trying to manage my time since I was already behind my opponent by about 25 minutes. And recognizing that like all these variations of pawn e4, in the best case, are good. And in the worst case, are just very terrible, and I'm also losing even more time. So, yeah, if I had a lot more time to think this game, if this weren't game 90, I would spend more time thinking. But I just played some moves. Um, pawn takes here. This is really emotional. I think a rational move would be to take this way. And, uh, like, all the positional trumps seem to be, I don't know, pretty balanced. Um... Yeah, I don't have any way to checkmate them, but they don't have any attack either. So this looks just, I don't know, pretty neutral. Um, this pawn takes on e5 is an attempt to throw the game into tumult, tumult, however you say it. Make this a very turbulent game. Um... Try to get the opponent to slow down and think more, if nothing else. Uh, but now they immediately respond knight d7, and that's a reasonable move. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to force my opponent to respond to what I'm doing, because as much as I care about the game outcome, I also care about, I don't know, trying to engage my opponent and make them think about things. Like, winning the game is not my only objective. I'm trying to have a conversation with the opponent um, and try to get their original thoughts. Uh, yeah, at this point, uh, so I'm already doing poorly time-wise. I spend a few minutes looking for alternatives, seeing, like, is surely is there must be some way to reroute the knight. Um, finding that 
like every time I try to reroute the knight through the edge of the board or through the left corner, just nothing good happens. Um, note that if knight e2, uh, pawn d3 wins the game. So unless I have some super sharp tactical response justifying the sacrifice, this is just not the way to go. So I picked the last square um, that tries to keep my knight at least halfway active. C5 is the knee-jerk reaction, and it feels like a good move, doesn't it? Connecting the pawn chain, opening the bishop's line, um, asserting a space advantage, and so forth. Um, I don't know that this is the right time to play C5. It's kind of... I mean... Yeah, it does a lot of good things. But what it doesn't do, like it does, yeah, it does protect the pawn. Um, but like this is such a nice position for black. Uh, so I just don't understand. I mean, how can I criticize? I don't know. Like, clearly I'm not, in any moral sense, better here. But, and here I just played my knight to the least active possible square. My opponent could pass multiple times and I wouldn't have anything I could safely do. If they were to pass once and I made a move, like, I can't make any aggressive move here other than pawn e6. This is just me retreating with my tail between my legs. Acknowledging that, hey, you can just do whatever you want. Okay, this game is yours. Um, there's nothing I can do right now. So something like even rook d8. Something like g5 is totally fine here. There's nothing I can do. Uh, the point here would be bishop d2. Knight e5, and this is threatening knight d3. And they, this is also still threatening c5. But uh, they played a different move order. They played c5 first. And I try to complicate the game because I recognize this is going south in a huge hurry. And I need any sort of complication I can find. Yeah, I defend against knight d3. I briefly considered, I don't know trying to find any way to sacrifice material to get an initiative. That didn't quite work out. Now where was... oh yeah. So my whole trick here, if they didn't play pawn d4, like say they had played... Oh, what was the trap here again? I think it was knight takes e5. If they played this... I was thinking this could happen. And even now looking at this trap, I'm kind of disappointed. Because I don't think this trap works. Um, I mean, yeah, there's knight d3 is one thing, but that's met by this, this. Um, and so like this refutes that variation, but I think that there's rook c8 here, and I've been looking at bishop takes, rook takes, and I could not find a way to make this succeed. Um, Note that if rook takes, rook takes, and if I take on e8, they take on e1. So I have to take here, uh, but then everything is just incidentally perfectly situated. Um, and if I do this, they have knight d3, and maybe there's something here. Um, Let's check. Yeah, this doesn't look great. This doesn't look good for me. 
Uh, no, I can't go rook c8 on account of bishop takes rook. And they're threatening to move the knight away and win my bishop on f1. So, like, that doesn't look convincing for, or useful. Um, so rook c8 seems to refute... I think during the game I saw this too. Both the knight d3 line not exactly working, but also noticed that... Um, well, I guess I hadn't looked fully at this during the game. Um, let's try to find... Let's see, I was looking at this, this... I noticed this line. Uh, this would not be good, right? So, pawn takes doesn't work here. Um, so I had been looking at queen f4. Uh, but I'm down a bishop, right? Being down a bishop is not great. So... Or, yeah, because I sack the knight. So none of that quite works. But this is the trap I had been trying to set. But rook c8 seems to defuse the trap. Had the... Had, um, Mr. Murphy here taken this way, I would have had to carefully reflect on this position. Um... But... I was trying to bait them into getting me this position in the first place because this looked really unclear and I was trying to get something that looked unclear. Possibly I would have just had to resolve to take this pawn, pawn takes, just play a normal game. Um, wait a second. Now pawn takes, I'm sorry, pawn takes seems like the more reasonable of the two moves. Even though during the game I didn't spend any time looking at this, because I knew I didn't have to look at it until the opponent plays knight takes e5. Um, because I had a fallback variation of knight d5, which looked complicated. Uh, I figured one of these two moves probably works. That's not entirely logical thinking, that's guesswork. But this is the way I was operating given the time deficit, which was induced by my poor opening knowledge. But no, come to think of it, so pawn takes cannot really be met with pawn takes because of this pin. Um, so the other thing I had very quickly looked at during the game was f6, being a fallback variation for them. And when I saw this, I just backed off and stopped looking at this. And started looking at all the other things with that, uh, this knight takes d5 variation. Just to see, like, if this looked at all appealing to them with this and rook c8. Um, then I thought, you know, there's some chance the opponent might play knight takes e5 here. If they find this rook c8. And therefore, if they find this rook c8, then... Um, I guess what I was thinking is that my opponent likely is not going to find this unless they slow down. And since they're not going to find this move, they're going to find rook c7 compelling. And since they're going to find rook c7 compelling, that means they're not going to play this knight takes e5 move. Even though I thought that this was the right thing for them to do. But I didn't think they were going to do it because of rook c7 although rook c7 is flawed. Anyway, my guess was correct. They played pawn d4. Um, so, yeah. We looked at all these variations, um, and none of it quite worked out um, after they find rook c8, but the opponent didn't find that. I think had they found rook c8, then they would have also had to consider this other variation here with pawn takes pawn. Which, I think after f6, even though, like, Grandmaster Feingold says never play f6, I think this is an exception. I think you play f6 here. Um, uh, but, again, it's confusing. 
and maybe there's something better. Um, I mean, f6 is not forced. Putting your own knight into a pin like this, that seems like a difficult pin to safely break. Seems like a difficult decision to make. Um, let me see if knight d3, rook takes, knight takes, rook takes, knight d3 again. This rook is going to be able to escape. Pawn takes pawn looks good. So yeah, maybe my opponent actually saw this pawn takes pawn. It's not the world's hardest move to find. And I had some reservations about this position. Um, oh, wait a second. What the hell am I talking about? Yeah, this just refutes pawn takes pawn. Um, so you could contend, and you'd probably be wrong to contend this, that white's threatening pawn takes pawn here again. And maybe there might be some initiative to, for white to have, uh, even down the exchange. I don't think so. So, yeah, I think as pieces get exchanged, this position is just going to get more and more difficult for white. So, actually, since both of those variations are bad for white, um... Yeah, this knight takes pawn should... It seems like the right thing for black to do. Um, that all in turn is saying that my pawn e4 is a bluff. And my pawn e4 is trying to back them out of doing knight takes pawn unless they carefully read all of that. If they calculate all this after knight takes pawn and see like all this is better for them then I'll have at least forced them to slow down and think about their moves. So pawn e4 is a bluff. Um, I Again, there doesn't seem to be anything useful I can do here other than try to bluff. I did look at knight takes pawn rook c7 here, which again is met by rook c4. Did consider some queen moves. Did consider pawn h4 or pawn a4. None of this really does anything. So I did the one thing that is just a gamble. It really is. And the opponent fell right into it. And so suddenly we have a complex position. Um, it took me a while to resolve to play knight d1 here, because I wanted to move the knight somewhere else. And the opponent's playing comfortable moves, and I'm playing uncomfortable moves. And... Yeah, not queen e6. Very comfortable. Um, perhaps a bit too slack. This just seems to burn a move. And under, like, if all the tactics work in my opponent's favor, then queen e6 is innocuous at best. It, like, sure, it threatens this pawn. Sure, you can bring out your bishop, and, you know, it's a really rosy picture. It's quite alluring to imagine that, like, simple moves can solve these sorts of situations. I think a complex move like this one, leaving this tension here, seems like the right thing to do. And, like, it's extremely hard for me to find a good move here if my opponent uses all of their pieces. And, I mean, what can you do? Incidentally, f5 is eventually on the table, and my king is still a sitting duck. So, if you're not such a fan of rook c8, maybe you try to play f5 here. I don't know. Like, this, this seems really dicey to play in this situation because of this uh, opening of the center file. Uh, although, hang on. This is the same tactic we just looked at a second ago. Um, sure, the bishop on b7 is hanging in this line, but I don't think I get time to take it. Um, so if I try take here, this is check again. This is check again. Um, 
Man, I'm wanting to find some knockout punch for the opponent, but I just don't see it. Like, this isn't quite a knockout. Uh, it looks pretty bad. But, um, yeah, no, I don't think this this is good for me. So, therefore, um, Pawn takes Pawn's not the right move here. And since I can't do Pawn takes Pawn, and they're threatening, like, G5, F4, like, this is pretty fatal, I think. There might be something here, I just don't see it. In any event, uh, the opponent plays this really comfortable move. I think this is a wasted move. And so I try to seize the initiative. Um, other variations did get looked at. At some point, we have to like make some progress on this post-game analysis and just recognize that we actually played a really forcing sequence here. Um, now... I have three pieces attacking c5. Um, since I have three attacking, you'd think that there's no time to defend the square, right? Um, and so it makes sense to counterattack. Again, my opponent played very quickly, and that's, I guess, why I'm so critical of this. So, by now they've spent ten minutes making all of their moves combined. Um, my play has been considerably slower, but it's okay. I spent some time examining rook takes, bishop takes, knight takes. Uh, what was it next? So one variation, queen defends here. I play this. And uh, I think what I resolved here made, that made the most sense for the opponent something like this and they control uh, the e6 square and the a2 square and this pawn is threatening to advance and i stared at this for oh goodness um my score sheet says i spent almost 10 minutes sometime around here trying to read out this and other similar end games trying to get some sense of what's going on I think the reality here is that they just have a, an enormous space advantage and all of my things are hanging and there I just don't have a tactical shot to justify this. This does not work. I wanted to get my queen and rook on their seventh rank and have some sort of miracle happen, but also a queen on a2 defends the f7 square and the e6 square. So there's like no chance of a miracle here. I really, really wanted there to be one, but I couldn't find one here. Um, separately, I spent time looking at queen b6, which looks somewhat interesting, um, but this doesn't quite work out. Um, so... Let's see. In the, this line, I'm trying... I don't know. So I can break up their pawns. But this is not advantageous for me. This is, I think, the best form of this variation. And even this sucks. Like, they have the bishop against my knight. And um, they have the initiative... Um, it's true that f seven's a bit difficult for them to hold on to. So there might be something here. There might be a little bit of a pull. But I could not find a way to make this beneficial for me. I think this... Having looked at all the other variations that could happen here, I think this is the best one I could have. But it just doesn't seem anywhere near good enough. Um... And that's even considering lines where I take here, take here, and then we play work b1 anyway. And this, um, so the shot here with rook b1, if you're not paying attention, is knight takes c5. Um, but 
this seems no good. And actually, knight takes c5 doesn't even work. So during the game, I hallucinated that if I take bishop takes rook takes pawn takes rook takes bishop. I didn't think that that was a exchange sacrifice, but it is. I thought it was a way that I could like get my rook on b7 and maybe get my bishop to hit f7 someday and some cheapo might happen. But, um, so this looks, I, in trying to consider that, um, and the possibility of setting up cheapos here, uh, I thought I saw something concrete that even shut this down even harder. I don't think it was bishop takes e4, but maybe it was. Maybe bishop takes e4 is good enough. Yeah, this was it. Sorry. Um, so... Let's see, they're threatening my knight. So I have to take here. And then after such a capture, you'd think this might give me some initiative. Um, no, this wasn't it, was it? Uh, let's see, Rook takes. Hmm. I thought I found something that just straight up busted this. Um, maybe not. Maybe it was not Bishop takes pawn then. I know I'd looked at c4. I considered bishop a6. Um, hmm. It's hard to say, isn't it? So. Mm -hmm. <sighs> maybe, maybe I just miscalculated this. Um. It's not impossible that I would. So I had two thoughts about this position. One is that bishop takes e4 might refute it. But two, my other thought was like, they could play something like this. I'm sorry, they can't do that either because their pawn's hanging. Never mind. Um, they If they could somehow defend this pawn on b6... Oh, maybe that was this. Yeah, this was it. So my knight is hanging. And if I should move the knight, they have lots of ways to continue an attack here. Um, if I don't move the knight, uh, e5, you could argue this is stubborn, but it's no good. Like, I'm just down uh multiple pieces in this line so there's only so much that being stubborn might be a good idea and giving up multiple pieces in one move is not the right way to go here um yeah during the game i was thinking about knight f4 and then my next thought was that they could play rook b8 and yeah, they're threatening this g5 bishop d3 idea. So they built quite an initiative here. I didn't think that, like, even short term, maybe this can't be played for some tactical reasons. But long term, I didn't think my attack could be sustained in this kind of endgame. So uh, yeah, I decided against this. Uh, and that's why I was looking, after I found queen b6, I was looking at rook b1 instead. And we have this series of exchanges. Maybe there's rook c takes b2 also? Uh, I didn't, like during the game I was thinking about rook c takes. And then spent maybe way too much time looking at this. Again, desperately trying to find some way to get an advantage here. I don't need to play for an advantage against an expert opponent, but um, 
but since I had a fallback variation in mind already, I was trying to play a bit ambitiously. My opponent plays another comfortable move after I play queen b2. I think queen b6, rook b1 was probably the best way to go, but they played this really comfortable move. I think queen b6 might have been more accurate. Because now here they actually have a divided pawn structure. There's some complexity in this position. It's not just instantly decided. Yeah, this pawn on e4 is hanging. Yeah, that's really uncomfortable. But, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time looking at variations. Where was it? Here or later? It feels like I spent a lot of time in this position. I did write down my move times in some cases. Um, so the move I played was knight takes c5 here. Uh, I'm looking for that on my score sheet. This is move number 25, is it? Oh yeah, so queen b2. Um, I spent a half hour on queen b2, leaving me with 14 minutes to play the rest of the game. So two-thirds of my time gone on this one move. Um, this is a one-and-a-half-hour game, so... Yep. Yeah being down so much while my opponent still has somewhere around 80 minutes on their clock. This is painful. Um, uh, but yeah, Rook AB8, I spent, uh, I don't, uh, not that long, like two or three minutes here. Could not find anything better than this. Again, I like, looked at Rook takes C5, it's just nothing. Maybe it is something, but I couldn't spot it. But anyway, here, now I'm in an endgame where I'm not even down a pawn. This is just a sad endgame. But we'll notice, like, I've gone from a very terrible opening to a bad middle game. Or, I'm sorry, a bad opening to a bad middle game to this endgame, which is just inconvenient. But, like, there's not a lot of winning chances here. But also, I can actually kind of, I don't know. If I had a lot of time, I would think that maybe half the time I could draw this endgame. It's, it's really hard. Um, it's not the easiest endgame ever. So my opponent plays rook e to d8. Um, and then impulsively, I played rook b5. Um, because my rook on c5 can't stop this pawn. Even if the rook goes back down the c-file, there's no stopping the pawn with this rook. Uh, my other rook can stop the pawn. And, yeah, actually does so quite effectively. So, at this point... Let's count this. We've got one, oops, sorry, one attacker, two attackers bearing down on the file. Our opponent has one defender. Also one defender here. So if you're keeping count, let's see, how do I get rid of arrows? I don't remember. Um, sorry, there we go. So yeah, this... They're just straight up outnumbered here. There's uh, there's just too much for them to try to fight off all at once. Um, yeah, if they spend time defending the rook, they don't have time to defend the bishop. If they defend the bishop, they don't have time to defend the rook. Uh, it's not a tactic I expected to show up here. Uh, they spend, they try to get out of this, that this doesn't even remotely get out of it, and pawn e5 just wins a bishop. So, we've escaped a turbulent opening, a turbulent middle game, and now suddenly I have a great advantage in an endgame. Um, the opponent had banked everything on this pawn d3. I take here, they play pawn d2, 
they had banked everything that this would work. If you're going to play such an aggressive style, um, I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Look before your leap is a maxim or saying or something of that sort. That, yeah, if you're going to commit to something, um, be sure that it works. Uh, otherwise, bad things can happen. Here I uncorked bishop c6. I think also playable might be bishop a6. So somehow here, where the opponent played, uh, what was it? Where they played rook d8. I don't think they envisioned this. Um, and funnily enough, I almost played rook b1 here. Which looks also pretty convincing. Um, I think here, however, um, maybe maybe this is okay for both of us. Um, so it's sort of thing where I get two rooks for the queen. Uh, this might be playable for both of us, although they have a passed pawn. Um, maybe I can somehow survive this. I don't know. It looks challenging, and maybe it's not playable. But, um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I did not have time to figure this out, and I'd spent a little time trying to look at this and then I found rook b5, and I'm like, wait, I'm just winning a piece. There's no need to do any of that. Back up. Look. So, yeah. I found the correct candidate move that just completely refutes rook d8. Um, and, I mean, this looks really scary, right? Uh, but if you play it right, so like here they're threatening this and this. Again, it looks really scary, um, but, you know, there might be some lines where somehow I'm forced to defend the rook on d1 and deal with them just constantly threatening this sort of thing. But actually, this just liquidates the attackers. Uh, so we play bishop takes, and here I met with a decision of um, queen takes or bishop takes. Um, and I think this is not the right move there. I think here this gets challenging. Like all these sorts of things where both players' pieces are hanging get confusing. Actually, this doesn't do anything, does it? Hmm. So, maybe that's fine. Maybe. There's also lines where... Well, thankfully the bishop is the same square color as the rook. So even in positions where somehow their rook makes it to c1 or e1, I should still be able to defend my rook in many cases. And so their passed pawn just doesn't succeed here. Regardless, I played bishop takes b5. Here, I expected queen e4, which looks kind of menacing here. Um, and if I do rook takes pawn, they do this fork. If I don't do rook takes pawn, I don't know. Oh, wait a sec. Um, hmm. Yeah, I expected this, where if this happens, I can't take the queen. Or I could take the queen, but it's not great. And this winning a move seems more important than trying to win a pawn there. Um, and I was trying to figure this out. Um, this does not look easy to figure out. There's like this sort of thing, but I think if queen e4, I have something better. 
Oh, right. So, instead of just letting them take my rook, I can play this. And this kills the attack. This kills the fork possibility, and since the fork possibility is gone, then I have this outnumbered. Um, so, queen e4 is probably the best trap. Oh, after queen c1... Or, I'm sorry, bishop f3 after queen c1. Let's see. I think we're talking about a different line. Because you're saying queen c1. I apologize, I've forgotten what the line was. The previous variation. So, um, yeah, so not this one. But we're talking about a line where this queen, I think, goes here. Sorry, I deleted the variation. I shouldn't have done that. Um, it's fine. Or is it? It couldn't be this line. No. It can't be this line. There's something somewhere around here. Yeah, I apologize. Reconstructing this might be a bit challenging at this point. But yeah, Bishop... That's another point, though. There, there was a variation during the game I did see where if they play queen c1, I just defend the rook. And um, they don't have a follow-up there. Similar to all these other variations. Like, if I could just hold the rook... Um, yeah. Bishop c6 here. Rook takes rook, queen takes rook, queen c1. Ah, yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, that's indeed. Uh, it'd be so funny to have another line here. Like, I kind of wish queen b8 and then queen b1 somehow worked. It doesn't quite cut it. But yeah, this, um... That's a double attack, hitting the queen and hitting the rook. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Vin Vin to the rescue points out that um, this is a double attack. At this point, the opponent would have to defend against the double attack, and um, I would be in the driver's seat again. Yeah. Yeah, so... That's one way. I mean, they could try rook c7 to deal with the double attack, but that actually probably just completely backfires. But this probably is not any better. I mean, for one thing, obviously the pawn is dropping. Um, it's like queen b2, and then I'm taking the pawn. Uh, but secondarily, maybe I have e6 or bishop e4 or something crazy also. So there might be multiple ways to solve this problem. Oh, actually, queen b2... Oh, queen b2... Yeah, if this were not... If this were hanging, and they could, like, take here and we exchange. Like, they're threatening queen e1 check. So there's still some hope of a trap here somewhere, but... Yeah, no, this is just convincingly better for me, I think, after this, which defends uh, this pawn and just shuts down the attacks. If they were to play queen c7, that would end the attack. Uh, if they try to defend like this, I don't think this is any better for them. Um, although I'm trying to find some awesome knockout blow and not quite seeing it. It's just uncomfortable. But there's nothing serious the opponent can do here. Because uh, the d1 square is well defended. Um, so yeah. I think rook c7 is probably the most interesting move in this variation. But it just doesn't do anything. Like, black's threatening to try to make a threat. But... Um, White, in the meantime, I'm trying to find, like, if queen d3, just collecting the pawn is reasonable, or maybe there's something better. Queen d3, rook c2 seems challenging. Oh, here we are. Yeah, so doubling on the pawn. Um, 
Doubling on the pawn looks really strong. E6 also looks pretty cool, actually. Um, I'm curious. Let's say they were to take this and we went down the rabbit hole. How deep does the rabbit hole go here? What happens? Um, is there not a fork somewhere here? I mean, wouldn't it be great uh, to win the game with some kind of awesome tactic here? This is over-the-top, gratuitous nonsense, but it would be nice. Um, <laughs> look, I'm trying to take the queen, but the rook's defending c1, so bishop h7 in an attempt to take the queen. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, here, check this out. Bishop h7, rook takes. Rook takes c1. Rook takes h6. Rook d1. White wins. That's one way to do it. It's stupid, but um, there's surely a cleaner way to do it. And the reason this wins uh, is because the rook can't go to d6 because there's a pawn in the way. Yeah, why I give away... The, there's no reason to give away this much material. It's just flashy. Um, no, you were pointing out another variation. Take h6 and then e6 with check. Yeah, so you can give check here and you can give check there. You give a lot of checks. And surely there's some way to win this somewhere with all these checks. Um, there's got to be some way. I don't see it, but, like, there's bound to be a win here somewhere. What's appealing about the other line is that it reaches a two-pawn up endgame that there's no question is winning. Here, yeah, we could check the king around a lot, but until we're able to take the pawn safely, um, the result is in doubt. So that's why we give away the materials, so we can get a known winning endgame. As opposed to an unknown, probably winning, but we don't know endgame. Uh, here, note if they play king f8 or king h8, we have this fork and then we can take on c1. Um, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, so like... What I'm trying to avoid is this forest of maybes. Um, yeah, we could take e6, but that's just a pawn. We don't need the pawn. Let's trade down, pick a completely winning endgame that we're going to win 100 times out of 100, and then just not worry about it. Um, now, the thing to worry about is that, you know, we picked this winning endgame, but is there another win game that's maybe even more winning? So yeah, this is like flashy and really cool and stuff, and we really know that, and we are absolutely certain that's winning. But like, it feels like there should be something else here, right? Or I guess your point is this one, where I still have the bishop, or have not sacked it yet. Yeah, why would I trade into that other winning endgame when this is a winning middle game? Um... I mean, surely this has to be a winning idle game, right? Um, so... Yeah, like queen b3 here seems quite reasonable. Yeah, there are a lot of winning variations in this case. So everything wins. Um, just don't hang the rook. Do not hang the rook here. But as long as you don't hang the rook, you're winning. Um, so, I mean, this is a check. Wait, if this check is so convincing, after queen takes, 
Maybe they don't block with the Rook. Because blocking with the Rook leads to that lost variation. Um, yeah, so they want to keep the Rook active, I guess. Um, hmm. The other appeal of the other variation is it's very direct and forcing. This doesn't seem quite so direct. Um, oh, there we go. So this wins the pawn. Um, so yeah, the king going to any dark square allows the pawn to be captured. Um, at least it feels that way. Is that really the truth of the matter? Like, it feels like in every variation there should be some way to be able to capture this pawn with gain of time. I mean, worst case, we just defend the rook and then later mop up the pawn. Yeah, you're right. There, there's no need to go into the complicated endgame here. So why not just queen takes pawn? Yeah, that's a very good point actually. Sorry I'm making this more difficult than necessary. Um, I was just really impressed that this endgame is completely winning and really flashy. Um, and this rook d1 just seems like over the top, but really cool. Um, so that was extremely forcing variation that's easy to calculate. But should have some intuition that here... I mean, rook queen takes pawn is probably not a good idea in the first place. There's probably some other way about this. Um, I don't know. Like, bishop takes g6 also looks kind of interesting. Everything's winning at this point. So this all goes to say that if we play pawn e6, our opponent can't oblige us and can't take the pawn, but also really can't decline taking it either. Um, yeah. Bishop f3 after rook f7. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait. Queen h6 and queen takes the pawn. Queen takes pawn here. Uh, so here I actually considered this, but now we've got a rook end game. Well, I have the bishop. This is the same end game. It's just I haven't given away a bishop. Why do I have two different feelings about the same end game? Um, wow. I'm being super irrational at the moment. Uh, I guess... Hmm. Yeah, I'm, there's no reason for me to be so irrational here. Uh, yeah, it's the same endgame, just without me throwing away bishop for no reason. Um, so, queen takes d2. The one thing that is maybe different here is that queen takes d2 is not forced here. The opponent could try something else. Um, like, I don't know, queen c5. And so, yeah, I'm up a bishop and probably should win this every time, right? But uh, I have to be careful. There's still moves to look at. Um, yeah, my position is immensely advantageous. But, um, yeah, queen h6, yeah, if you play the engine moves, you're fine here. Like, white is winning this. Um, yeah, so th there's no way that black can hold this position. I mean, you could find moves that try to put up resistance. None of them's going to work. Mm -hmm. Rook d8 is a threat. Yeah. So if you just play enough very good moves and completely crush the opponent's defense, 
then there's not anything to look at there. I'm not sure that queen h6 is actually the way to go in that position, by the way. Like, there's queen d8 immediately, right? So you could do this, and then exchange the rooks, and then you have a queen and bishop endgame. Um, but I guess what you're saying is that somehow queen h6, queen e7, like, you're saying you know how white wins this, bring the rook into the attack somehow, and it's just fine. Yeah, like, this is a winning middle game. It requires some accuracy, but it's doable. Um, so, this, I guess, is just a question of playing style. Would you rather, in time pressure, would you rather play the thing that you know is going to win every time, or the thing you believe will probably win, even if you don't know it? Like, I've had more winning endgames than this against uh, equally or better stronger players. And I've thrown positions pretty similar to this one. Even, like, in a standard time control, I've not managed to convert this every time. So I think there's some practicality in just choosing the thing that liquidates the pieces. Um... That said, yeah, bishop f3. Yeah, I mean, what can black do, right? White is clearly far stronger here. I guess you're threatening rook d4, rook g4. To deal with that threat, you could try to block it this way, but then this just crushes on the spot. So, yeah, bishop f3 looks like the right way to go here. And, um, I guess as an effect, um, well, I mean, if they see that you're threatening rook g4, they could play this move. And now you have to find a way to, uh, activate the rook some other way. Welcome. Yeah, we're just reviewing this game today. That's uh, an interesting game. Uh, but... Yeah, I think certainly black is winning this. But if your question is, like, why would we do the other thing? The other thing that seems like, hey, we're giving away material. It's because we want to win. That's the answer. This is just a known win. There's nothing the opponent can do to stop the g-pawn and h-pawn. And uh, they don't have counterplay anywhere. Like I said, sorry, today we're looking at this game. The title of the live stream is that we're reviewing a game that I played. That's what we're doing right now. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, this is interesting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that I'm winning in other lines here, too. So, yeah, this bishop c6 was such... Such an emotional moment in the game. Like, this was the culmination of things that had started when the opponent first played their slack move on move 20, and here we are on move 31. So, let's go back and move 20, take another look at this. So our opponent plays queen e6, which looks beautiful. It looks to hold the entire position together. But I managed to keep generating threat after threat after threat. Um, and here, I didn't take the easy path out. Like, yeah, rook takes c5 looks interesting. Even knight takes c5 to some degree looks a little bit interesting. Although this one's kind of easier to dispense with um, because this pawn hangs. And I tried to find any way to get an initiative here. Because it looks like I have a fork, but um, this is there's just no way to break this down. And worst case, um, the opponent could play like rook b8 or something to hold this. They could also consider like queen a6 if they had to, but 
yeah, this point is well defended here. So uh, I just managed to keep making threats, try to make things complicated, try very hard to make things complicated. And just very unexpectedly, this tactic shows up and suddenly our opponent is in this universe of pain that's just so challenging to deal with. Um, maybe here... So since they've, I have this pin, I'm winning at least an exchange, maybe more. I haven't even counted up how much I'm winning here. Um, but given the material that's about to get exchanged, um, yeah, I was thinking maybe my opponent could consider queen e7, queen d7, queen a6, these sorts of things. Trying to irk. Yeah, heck, even queen c6 might be worth looking at, albeit briefly. Um, but yeah, queen d7 tries to get the queen to defend this. Um, so I think against this, I was considering rook d1. Uh, this is such a tense moment. So one possibility is e5, and bishop takes... Rook takes, and what was it here? I was thinking like bishop c6. Yeah, this looks kind of spooky. So this is one option. I don't think this would have been my best way to proceed with pawn e5. So rook b1 looks a bit more interesting here. Um... But the problem with rook b1 is that the opponent threatens to promote this pawn. And if we exchange here, um, let's see, queen takes, rook takes, d2. Um, my bishop has time to stop this pawn. Uh, it's just barely in time. And here I have a one pawn up endgame. So, um, this could be, well, I'm sorry, I'm up upon this instant. Uh, the problem for the opponent, I guess, is that this is actually hanging, and I'm not seeing a good way for them to defend it. That is so sad how close this is to working. Um, because you would think there would be chances here. You would imagine somehow that something would be possible. But, um, okay, so if I exchange on b7, there's nothing. Uh, if I play this, then there's this exchange. And again, this is even worse. So that doesn't quite work either. So this queen exchange is necessary, but then it loses the a-pawn. So that's one... I was thinking queen d7 might be the appropriate way to counter rook b5. But queen d7 just loses the pawn. I didn't think this would be adequate, this pawn d3. But I would started to look at it when my opponent very quickly responded with rook d7 instead of d3. But d3 might have some purpose. Um, it looks complicated. So draw the queen away from d2. Play d2. Um, try to force the rook away. But I don't think this works either, because I can defend the rook. I have also f3 here, which looks sad, but um, let's see, a rook takes b7 is not convincing. Um, this rook's hanging. There might be something here. Um, but I'm up a bishop, and I can defend this point. It looks difficult. There are a lot of challenging looking lines. But possibly I'm just winning in all of them. Even though this looks challenging. 
maybe there isn't actually a fight here. Maybe just everything fizzles out. I don't know. Uh, so d3 looked somewhat interesting. Queen d7 looked somewhat interesting. Oh, I'd not consider queen c8. I missed this. Maybe we both missed this. What happens here? I don't know. Let me put some text up just for visual interest for viewers. So again, this is a CICL game. Um, yeah, what happens in this case? What if I triple down on this saying, I'm going to win a piece no matter what? What happens? Um, Rook takes... Uh, do, do. Oh, this is the same endgame, isn't it? Just through a different move order. One move away. One move away. So Queen C8's not miracle either. Um. Wow. Okay. Now, is that. Does the same logic apply if Queen C6 or any Queen move, depending if this Bishop happens? Um. Yeah, for a minute there, queen c8 looked really interesting, and then the rook b1 shows up and reveals that there's no defending this file. Um, it's just an illusion. So this is just... rook b5 is extraordinarily strong, and there's no escaping it at this point. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know that there's any way to try to make this tricky beyond what we've looked at here. So, yeah, rook d8, rook e d8 just completely loses the thread. And there were so many ways to avoid the situation. Um, yeah, like, during the game it started looking at this, and this does look a bit complicated, but, I mean... In the game, we went out of the frying pan and into the fire. And that's where we ended up. So, yeah, I was debating, do I play, like, queen a3 here? Do I play queen takes pawn? Like, how do I respond to this? They put themselves in a pin, but it seems like a pin that can be broken. Um... There's like queen b6 here, exchanging one pin for another. Um, but then bishop takes, rook takes, rook takes, and this hangs. So, wait, bishop takes, rook takes, rook takes, never mind. That's not how this works. Yeah, so this, I think, is what I spotted during the game, actually, is that if the opponent tries too hard to escape this pin, uh, well, queen b6 is just not the right way about it. I'd started looking at f5, and f5, f3, queen b6, trying... I mean, I don't think this even... this can't work either. So white just takes the pawn. And my opponent saw through all of that. Like, where I could make jokes about maybe the opponent saw this, or maybe the opponent saw that. Like, there's a good chance they actually spotted this particular line. Uh, just, this doesn't seem to retain any water at all. This line, with bishop takes pawn. Um, so, wait, how did we get here? Oh, bishop takes pawn was the key move. Um... But queen takes d4 seems more than good enough here. Queen a3 is one of the things I'd started to consider. Again, I was in severe time pressure at the time I was making these moves, so... Um, yeah, I think queen takes d4 is probably... It looks, at least at this point, convincing. 
Uh, queen a3 is a fallback variation, just in case I need to hold the pawn. And threatening the a pawn might be good enough, but yeah, it started to look at all of these things when the opponent very quickly had responded to rook d8 instead and fell headlong into this rook b5 tactic that I didn't even set up this as a trap, but it just happens. So queen, bishop takes e4. I thought this is going to be complicated, and I was unsure of whether I was better or worse there. But I was sure that if I didn't play this knight takes and then rook takes c5, I was definitely going to be worse. So we've eliminated all the other options, and that's how we got to this through process of elimination. But um, that's not to say this is... I don't know. This still could be quite bad for me, despite my playing quickly here. Um, yeah, the queen's actually not on a good square here. So uh, I am threatening the d-pawn, which is difficult to defend. My bishop is blocked. And if they could just plunk some piece on the e5 square safely, they'd be fine. But... I think I'd succeeded in making this complicated. Um, maybe bishop d5 outright refutes what I'm doing. Um, maybe. The idea being queen d4, bishop a2. And, like, all my pawns are on this side of the board. They have this passed pawn on the outside. Um, this looked complicated. I was willing to try this. Uh, another thing I was considering after rook takes c5 was thinking, well, surely they'll just move the bishop somewhere like this. And I tried to find, is there some way I could exploit this and pin it somehow, or what can I do? Because uh, I was starting to look at this... And uh, even though I get the bishop there, I thought there would be some line where they would not have to give up the bishop. Like, I'd seen queen d4, and then started looking at rook d8, trying to find time to move the bishop away to safety. Uh, and consequently, rather than this line, I'd also started to take a look at bishop a8. So I was juggling all four of these ideas, and maybe a few more, um, like queen b6, or king f8, or king h8. I'm juggling all these sorts of ideas when the opponent played rook d8. Um, but yeah, I think bishop a8, um, having looked at all these other possibilities, bishop a8 looks pretty reasonable at this point, right? Where the point here is that if I take the d-pawn, I lose the a-pawn. And I was just in a frenzy over this during the game. Like, I did not want to give up the a-pawn here. Um, even though I saw that I'd have this possibility. Because, um, again, like that other line, this queen just defends the f7-pawn. There's not going to be any shot on f7. If I generate some tactic, it's going to take a lot of luck here. Um, I guess the luck, though, is that this a7 pawn seems hard to defend. Uh, even with the queen on this file defending it. Um, so maybe there's something going on here? Maybe? Um... What happens if brick b1? I mean, this looks fascinating, right? <sighs> if rook b1... Um, do I play rook cc1? Or rook ec1? Or rook ef1? Rook ef1 looks interesting. And if they exchange rooks, my bishop's on a decent square. Um... Well, no, if rook ef1, and note if I take back this way, 
I'm giving up the e pawn. Uh, if they try taking here, oh, maybe it's fine. Maybe I'm not dead. It looks terrifying with them, with all their pieces bearing down on my position. But maybe it's fine. Um, so if they try to greedily snap the pawn right away, maybe I'm fine there. Um, I mean, the other obvious candidate is a5. And you'd think that this would lean to something like Rook A7, but Rook A7 comes with a possibility that maybe they defend A5 somehow. Um, and if they can, then this gets messy. Um, also, maybe A5 is not the right move. Maybe the right move is actually A6. And if that, this. And if this, um, so if I'm trying to snap the pawn in a6, I don't know. This can't possibly work, right? e5 is a pipe dream. If e5 ever works, it's just mad. Um... How can this possibly work? Am I going to go through all five phases of grief over this move? Questioning, like, I don't know, everything about chess? It seems crazy that a move like this could work here. Um, but it might. That's kind of... Ah, we had a clubmate who would always get positions that looked like this. And we'd question... Like, how did you get this position? Also, how do you convince your opponents to blunder? But, yeah. Um, I'm just not seeing. Yeah, I don't know. This is the sort of thing an engine would do well to process. This looks really complicated. I guess maybe the most convincing refutation would be something like this. Um, so a6 is only a targeted once at the moment, and the thought would be, well, maybe I could get two pieces to target it later, right? Uh, so we do that. And then... Um, well, actually, maybe we... Can, no, yeah, we have to do this now. Uh... And then we could play rook e6. And this protects the a pawn. And um, incidentally, other threats just don't seem to quite work. Um, there is this threat that looks super threatening. But then there's rook g6. And again, this just holds. And once black has finally solidified this fortress that they built, if they can, uh, then this outside passed pawn might provide some initiative later, if this fortress holds. Uh, does it hold? I'm not totally sure. Like h4, h5 looks really messy. But Black's Fortress looks safer than White's Fortress. Um, but also looks like White's not about to get checkmated. Um, like, this looks like a, a shape that either this will completely survive with a strong advantage, or it will be completely obliterated. Um, and it's just a matter of which it is. But it looks like a really strong shape. I just can't tell if that's a facade or not. Either way, it feels like I've missed something pretty significant if everything comes down to a variation like this. Uh, first of all, bishop b7 is not forced. Um, 
Yeah, I just... It's hard to say what's going on here. If bishop b7 were forced... Or, I mean, there's maybe rook takes f1 instead. Um, I don't know. It's really hard to say what's going on. Um, and that's in this line with rook e f1. There are other lines as well. So I've been juggling all of these thoughts. Uh, in the moves, like, in leading up to taking this, where I'd been debating, do I play queen b2, do I play rook c2? Uh, rook takes pawn, do I play knight takes pawn? And juggling all these thoughts uh, when this suddenly popped on the board. And then I played this and s after playing it realized what a good move it was. Um, so I got a bit lucky, but when you're spending your time trying to play the right moves and thinking carefully about the game, good things can happen. It's, yeah. Chess, there's a huge, huge skill factor to it, but it is a two-player game, and therefore there is some human error and luck involved because of human error. Um, I did skim a bit over some of these moves here, didn't I? Like, pawn takes c5, I've been wondering, well, what if the opponent just does this? And this is kind of what I've been expecting the opponent to do. Um, let's try to liquidate into something more like that, where here, this like very clearly looks equal. They control this, almost all the squares on the C file. They have this, uh, pawn that I can't easily smash. Um, or I'm sorry, they have this pawn that like, I don't have an easy way to target. <sighs> They control this diagonal, and my pawn blocks my bishop. And sure, well, I guess I was threatening this. Yeah, so I guess I could throw this in first. Um, yeah, and during the game, I've been trying to find some tricky combinations here, finding trying to find um, moves for both players. Uh, it's not easy. But I think they avoided... Well, I'm sorry, queen d6 might also be a terrible idea on account of that pawn e5 discovery, so I was thinking queen e7 instead. Um, where he still has a triple attack on this pawn, but uh, I was thinking we'd get an endgame that looked like this. Which seems to lightly favor my opponent. Um, and I thought they would bring the rook out of the corner, and I didn't see a great way to continue here. But I didn't think I was going to get any better deal than this. Um, yeah, maybe there's some tactics here. Um, so it's hard to say. Engines would know. So I was thinking, even though this bishop takes c5 looks kind of crazy, if you look at the end of the variation, this actually looks decent for the opponent. Like, it just feels very difficult to break progress as white with my pawn blocking my bishop, with their rook beautifully positioned on this open file, with their queen controlling many dark squares and mine being kind of over here, trying to make a threat. And yeah, I can jostle here, make a threat here, make a threat there, but long term, it feels like things are strongly in their favor. And it feels like I just don't have an attack at all. But if I play very patiently, maybe someday once more I'll get a chance to attack. So this just took a lot of patience being willing to go accept things like that that were really miserable endgame possibilities. Uh, queen takes is forced here, so there's no need to mull that over too carefully. Queen e6 looks beautiful. 
Um, but looks can be deceiving. Uh, during the game, I'd been thinking about this queen g5. Um, thinking that, you know, uh, this e pawn is kind of loose. And if they exchange queens, then they can pile up their rooks on the e pawn. And meanwhile, I just still don't have any attack. Although maybe I could, like, somehow liquidate all the pawns and not lose my e pawn before this pawn gets too far up in my business. Exchanging queens, I thought, would also make these pawns more menacing than they currently are. So I was debating, do I exchange here? Do I play something absolutely mad like f4? What do I do? So I was thinking they might do queen g5. Or alternatively, I was thinking maybe they'll chicken out of queen g5 and play queen h5 instead. But this just drops the pawn for no reason. Um, so... At least in the queen g5 line, they're able to, like, liquidate some pieces and be able to target a2 and f2 pretty quickly. Whereas, um, yeah, after queen h5, that just loses a move. This is a nice fork. This reclaims the pawn on c5. And if the opponent wasn't okay with me reclaiming this pawn, well, I mean, the most obvious consideration would be if you don't want the pawn if you don't want me taking back on c5 maybe don't take the pawn i know we did quickly look at this bishop takes line right but again this leads to exchanges on my terms but this isn't checkers right um as long as they control the square I'm not really making a threat right now. It might feel like I'm making a threat, because my pieces are strewn all over the board, because some of them are lined up with each other. Um, but pawn c6 just loses the pawn. I don't think I have a real threat in this position. And taking on b6 allows pawn takes b6 in response, which strengthens the rook on a8. So, the closest thing I think I have to a threat in this position, let's say they just play king h8, maybe I'm threatening this. But boy, that is dangerous. So, um, I mean, maybe I'm threatening this. I'm not even sure if this is halfway reasonable. And, even if this is halfway reasonable, like, look, they have this threat. If I take over here, they have this threat. They're also threatening simply to take on c5 without my knight c3 or knight d3 fork. So, like, just a little bit of patience could have gone a long way here, I think. Um, but instead, we traded into an endgame. And they overvalued their advanced pawns, which do look quite threatening. And if I don't find this queen b2, I could be in a universe of a lot of danger. Uh, another possibility, still another, would be rook e to b8, which is uncomfortable because this bishop is bearing down on this long diagonal, right? Um... So, during the game, I mean, if we try playing the same game moves here, or same moves as what showed up during the game, uh, bishop takes, rook takes, and in the game they played rook d8. Here, I don't think they have to play rook d8. Um, so, what was so appealing in the game about this. What was it? I don't know. We looked at a line down here, right? With bishop takes e4, and then maybe I deleted it because it didn't work out. Oh, here it is. Bishop takes e4 with the rooks on b8 and e8. Uh, queen d4, f5 is what we were looking at. 
Um, now, what about this line? What if I play queen takes d4 here? Um, can they play this? And now I don't have rook e5 threatening that. Um, maybe this is playable? But does this also work in the other bishop takes e4 line? Like, where I was considering f5? Do they also have bishop or rook b1 in this line? It looked spookier here somehow. But maybe this works out for them. Yeah, I'm just being crazy. This is at least as good as the other line. Um, I'm just entering this with a different mode of thought. Um, but in this position, it's at least as good to have the rook on e8 as it is on a8. Um, having it on e8 would strengthen the center rather than weaken it. So there's... Yeah, rook e to b8 is just baloney. Um, but it did inspire us to look at, uh, what was it? The bishop takes e4 line. Wherever that went. That's a bit unfortunate. These aren't annotated in some way that's super easy to navigate. I mean, yeah, this is a, as easy as it can get, but it still isn't super easy to navigate. Also, did that other variation just disappear on me? When I deleted the parallel variation, I don't. I don't think it disappeared. I'm scanning all over trying to find the bishop takes e4 line. Maybe I should just try to find the move on the board. Um, so where was it? So. Yeah, it was after this. I think that it was... Yeah, here it is. Bishop takes e4. Um, rook b1. So, I don't have a refutation of rook b1, do I? Like, queen takes bishop, rook takes rook, queen takes rook, queen takes queen is no good. Um, so... Yeah, I'm not seeing a way to refute rook b1. That's pretty funny. Rook c1 seems to try to survive against it, but doesn't refute it. So we can exchange rooks here. We could exchange bishops here. Oh, hang on. That looks strong. That looks very painful to deal with. Um, so that's to say... Uh, rook b1 might be winning. Unless an engine finds some clever resource that saves this pawn. Um, rook b1 seems to win the a pawn. So, wait a sec. So that would mean that queen d4 could be refuted by rook b1. And if rook b1 is such a strong counter threat, um, needs to be taken seriously, then. Um, does this work at all? I don't think so. So, like, this is not even remotely close to working. Um, so, bishop takes, queen takes, uh, while tempting... Yeah, rook takes e4 is no good. Not even remotely good. Uh, queen e2, d3 looks spooky. Um, well, queen e2, d3 prevents rook b1, right? So in this line, this bishop is pinned now. So there's no rook b1 anymore. Um, which I think would suggest that pawn d3 does not happen. 
So I have three pieces attacking, they have two defending. Oh my goodness, this is a whole can of worms. Um, that's amazing. So d3 is not correct then. You'd have to remove the attacker. Um, let's see. Bishop takes, queen takes, queen takes, rook takes. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, what is going on here? This is incredible. Um, I don't know. This is incredible. Let's find a piece, a position where all the pieces are hanging at once. So, again, this might be worthy of consideration. If rook takes, rook takes, takes, um, here the queens could be exchanged. Um, doesn't feel like there's much else for white to do besides this queen exchange. And whether or not we throw in rook c8 check first, and we probably do. Yeah, rook c8 check seems necessary. Um, this looks extremely dangerous. I don't think white survives this. Rook d6, king f1, d3, king e2. Yes, yeah, so the king barely stops the pawn in time. If you play d3 first, rook d8, rook e2, rook takes pawn, rook takes pawn. Black has the outside pass pawn. Which, depending on your knowledge of endgames, um, well, in many cases it's a draw, in many cases it's a win. I think this would be one of the drawn cases, but that's just a test of my knowledge set. Uh, also, rook a6, rook d8, rook takes pawn, rook takes pawn. Yeah, that's doesn't cut it either. Um, rook d6, rook c7, d3. I'm oh, sorry, rook d6, king f1, rook d7. Yeah, this, this looks like the diciest variation. So if the king moves to try to stop the pawn, uh, black can defend all the pawns and run the king toward the center. Or maybe not in that order. Maybe they're threatening, actually, uh, this king move. And this king move like holds the f-pawn while also threatening to bring the king to e4. So, while normally you'd want to bring the king into the action as quick as possible, like king f3, d3, rook c1, d2, rook d1. Yeah, king f3 looks playable then. Um, uh, but king f3 is aiming for... A... There's two candidate moves here. There's king f3 and there's rook c7. Oh, this is tricky. Yeah, king f3 might be more active. Um, yeah, king f3 feels like the right move. It would be very hard to prove that rook c7 is correct. If it is correct, it's a beautiful move. But, no, the king has to stop this pawn. Rook c7 can't be superior. It would be incredible if somehow rook c7 were actually the superior move here. Um, yeah, they don't have to play d3. Further, like, playing d3 just weakens the pawn. Um, it would be amazing if somehow king f1 is actually the best move here. It could be. And chess is full of amazing positions. But if they play d3 immediately, this weakens the pawn and makes it easier to snap up. Meanwhile, the rook is able to move to d2, also protecting the a pawn. And then while you're taking this, there's no counter shot. Um, but yeah, they don't have to play d3 immediately. 
Note, this is not really threatening to play king e4. The main threat, I think, here is rook c2, and then maybe king e4. Um, I think that's where we're at. And I think this is equal. Um, yeah. You'd think... Yeah, you would probably bail on the idea of trying to promote the d-pawn and do any line which results in capture of the a-pawn. That's a slightly finessing what you're saying. Uh, I think this is even more precise. Um, because, yeah, you do want to take the a-pawn. But this like leaves one last chance uh, for some sort of tactic first. Um, and this one last chance might somehow lead to all these pawns advancing much faster with the king supporting them and with some kind of mate threats. So, like, I would think you'd throw this move in first, but you don't expect to promote the d-pawn. D-pawn is not going to promote unless white seriously messes this up. But, yeah... You don't play this with the attitude of trying to promote the pawn right away, because anytime you push the pawn, thing terrible things happen to your position. Um, so it falls to white to find the next move. But yeah, I think this is really deep down the rabbit hole. Um, probably I've missed something more critical earlier in the variation. Though it would be fantastic if this were actually uh, the right thing. For once, I believe, like, this might actually be the most critical variation I might have read at or calculated. These might be the actually correct things to consider here. Um, with maybe Queen E2 being dubious, but the idea behind Queen E2 is wanting to try to stir up some sort of a counterattack. Um while, I don't know, not getting checkmated. Um, so this counterattack's based on the pin in the center, and I think we see that rook b1 adequately deals with this pin in the center of the board. So queen e2, I think uh, black is better in that endgame. So that's one variation down. Um, another variation to consider is queen a3. And after this, I think rook b1 is still on the table. Um, but there might be additional possibilities based on there only being two pieces attacking this bishop. And, like, white's weak. I don't know. Everything. It just seems like there is a lot of possibility for threats to spawn out of nothing here. Yeah, no, rook b1 still seems right for all the same reasons. If you trade rooks here, then the e-file opens up your threatening queen e1. If the bishop blocks, then bishop d3, while temporarily not available. Um, it's a latent threat. Rook e2 is also a latent threat here. So queen a3 seems a bit too risky for this position. Uh, something that hadn't occurred to me until just now. That's interesting. <laughs> That's a move. Uh, that is pretty cool. Holy moly. Uh, so... There's a pin on the e-file. Uh, white's wanting to liquidate the bishops. Um, along with a lot of other pieces. But only under circumstances where the d-pawn also gets captured. This might be complicated, to say the least. Um, yeah. Maybe queen d6 here. Uh, you might be talking about the other variation, or maybe about this one. Yeah, queen d6 looks somewhat interesting. 
So this gives up the threat on the A2 pawn in exchange for stuff and things and stuff. <laughs> um, hmm. Hmm. I mean, what I want to do here is defend my queen and then try to renew the threat on the e-file. But then a bishop exchange of pushing the d-pawn looks very strong, so this can't be right. Um, another idea might be just to attack this pawn directly a second time. Um, but this tactically seems to fail. Yeah, the uh, queen d5 fork threat is too strong here. So that's no good. Um, yeah, queen d5 as a fork threat is very strong in this position. Um, mm, I don't think it's just queen d5. Yeah, queen d6 looks like a perfect counter to queen a1. Um... I mean, maybe this? You would think rook b1 would be a way to counter this. No. Rook b1 would be exchanging two rooks for a queen, but then this rook is hanging and this is threatening to advance. Uh, rook b1 can't be it here. But bishop takes bishop looks interesting. Um... Yeah. Yeah, maybe queen d6. So. I I think our answers for both players are going to be found in a middle game. Because this end game, the ones that happen toward what happened in the game, they none of them quite work out. Um, the most promising end game I think we saw was the one we were just looking at in the previous variation. Stuff like this, uh, again, seems like a middle game contest, but you know, the previous variation we were looking at, um, where was it? I think up here. No, that's not it. Sorry. I seem to have completely lost my mark. I think it was later on. It was one of these super long variations, something like this. This seems like the, um, of all the variations we looked at, it seems like white might select this variation, and yet black might still be winning it. That's the point I was trying to make, is that of all these crazy endgames we were looking at, this one looks like the compromise that both players might agree to if they had multiple hours to look at moves. Um, but, uh, and since I think black is better in this endgame, this is probably the path that I would go down if I were playing black. But I think what Bouncing Across suggested in that other middle game line with queen d6 looks quite palatable to most players. Most players would not try to grind things down in an endgame. I tend to prefer my end games because uh, it's easier to manage risk. Um, but yeah, a lot of players enjoy their middle games and the wild possibilities that are offered. And you'd think that I've been playing this game, like I mentioned, I started playing my first tournament games, uh, USCF tournament games, 20 years ago. So uh, you would think that given how many absolutely bonkers, off-the-wall, middle-game and end-game positions I get, you would think that, hey, this player who gets these insane positions all the time enjoys playing them. Uh, I think the enjoyment comes from twofold. One, just the storytelling and discussion that we get to have after a game, reviewing it, looking over what might have been. And so that's quite fun. 
Uh, and secondly, it's enjoyable, just this tremendous release that occurs once all the tension's resolved, once you find the move like bishop c6 that looks unfindable, the thing that like finally slow forces both players to slow down and take a breath and consider what just happened. Um, yeah, this final like release of the tension that's been building up over so many minutes and hours uh there's some joy in that but yeah do i enjoy getting these bonkers positions that like we go look at all these variations and these other variations do i is it this chaos that i admire i don't think so so my retrospective over my career so far at least in the uscf and the cicl is, yeah, I get crazy positions a lot, but I've played some normal games too, and I think they have just as interesting stories to tell. Um, it's just that it's a lot easier to tell stories about these insane positions, because it's quite visible that so many things are happening. Whereas if you play a more normal opening, um, like, all this complexity is beneath the surface. And, I don't know, it's easily glossed over. The same way when you look at Grandmaster games in various textbooks or magazines or whatever, they tend to gloss over all these nuances that uh, you just take for granted. But here, because it's such an odd position, you have to look at all these insane moves. Like... I don't know, there's this compulsion to have to go look at everything here um, that's just not present in a normal game. So, uh, that makes it at least more obvious during the post-game review that there's just so, so much to review. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe we leave it there. That was quite an interesting analysis. Um, hope we enjoyed that. And yeah, it's just, yeah, this kicks off our 2022 to 2023 Chicago Industrial Chess League season. Uh, hopefully we'll bring more games in the future. Will they be as insanely complicated as this game? I don't know. Not sure if we're going to be so privileged as to play against such a strong opponent every single game. So definitely it's a treat to play against such an opponent. Uh, we'll do our best. We'll see how things go. So yeah, I hope we enjoyed this post-game analysis together. It's quite a journey. If nothing, even if like the game itself doesn't yield any grand discoveries, maybe this way of looking over a game, going at it in great detail, might inspire us to think about how we think about our thinking and how we review our games. So this is just how I do it. Other players have other ways of reviewing their games, but this is just my method. Um, yeah, maybe I should watch how other people review their games too, and then do some sort of a video about how we review games and how each player does it differently and strengths and weaknesses of various approaches, and we can all learn something together from that too. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this, and thanks for watching.